Has there ever been a warplane as mythic as the Mitsubishi Zero? Legend, mystery, and rumor conflated to create an unbeatable fighter flown by samurai tough pilots. The Zero was said to have an awesome performance, superb maneuverability, and combat characteristics in order of magnitude ahead of anything else in the sky. The oft-forgotten fact is that the Zero's effective combat career was measured in months. The Mitsubishi A6M Zero is a long-range carrier-based aircraft fighter formerly manufactured by Mitsubishi Aircraft Company, a part of Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, and was operated by the Imperial Japanese Navy from 1940 to 1945. The A6M was designated as the Mitsubishi Navy Type Zero carrier fighter, or the Mitsubishi A6M Raisin. The A6M was usually referred to by its pilots as the Raisin, or Zero, being the last digit of the Imperial Year 2600, or 1940, when it entered the service with the Imperial Navy. In the official designation, A6M, the A signified a carrier-based fighter, 6 meant that it was the sixth such model built for the Imperial Navy, and M indicated Mitsubishi as the manufacturer. The official Allied report name was Zeke, although the name Zero was used colloquially as well. Not counting its earliest sucker punch missions over China, when the best trained fighter pilots in the world swatted down scores of ill-flown Polikarpov biplanes and open cockpit monoplanes. The Zero resigned supreme in the Pacific War, only from the day of the Pearl Harbor attack until American pilots learned the tactics that allowed even pudgy F-4F Wildcats to level the aerial playing field during the Guadalcanal campaign in the summer and fall of 1942. When the second generation of US World War II fighters, the P-38, F-4U, and F-6F arrived beginning in early 1943, the Zero was finished as an effective fighter. In January 1944, a single Marine F-4U pilot, First Lieutenant Robert Hansen shot down 20 Zeros in just 17 days. The Zero soldiered on until the end of the war. Of course, many self-immolating as kamikazes, but only because the Japanese had nothing to replace it, and the Zero often was simply a cannon fodder. The June 1944 Marianas turkey shoot is the most notorious example of such an equity. Not that the Zero wasn't still dangerous even in the 1945s, especially if an aviator was cocky enough to try to dogfight one of the few remaining experienced Zero pilots. Nobody ever built a fighter that could outmaneuver it, and the fact that Grumman developed the F-8F Bearcat as Zero Beater, a task that it was to do just a bit too late to fulfill, shows that the Zero was never entirely disdained. The Japanese had counted on a short, brutal war to force the U.S. to the negotiating table in order to establish unfettered area of Japanese exploitation in South Asia and the Pacific. So Japan had done little to prepare for a protracted conflict. Zero pilots were superbly trained, but only hundreds at a time. Then a few thousand a year while the U.S. was turning tens of thousands of college grads into pilots. The great majority of Japanese pilots were the equivalent of our NCOs nor was the production of a Zero success for given high priority. Much like the German High Command initially assumed the ME-109 would suffice for the duration of the war and that it didn't need an engineer or a successor, the Japanese waited too long to develop and produce the Schneiden, Raiden, and Repu. Or perhaps they should have developed just one of them. It didn't help that Japan, a small island nation with limited engineering and manufacturing manpower, spent its time dithering over the development of more than 90 major combat types as well as several dozen lesser models. By the time they did get serious, raw materials were lacking and the country's skilled airframe and engine workforce had fled the manufacturing centers due to being bombed out of their homes. The Zero was incrementally improved throughout the war, from the A6M2, the first model to take on American fighters, to the A6M8 only two ever built, intended to attack B-29s. The Zero's excellent Nakijama-built Sake engine was eventually upgraded by about 150 horsepower, but it never attained anything like the horsepower offered by the Pratt & Whitney R-2800, the P-38's Twin Allisons, or the P-51's Packard Merlin. The Zero's power-to-weight ratio was always better than that of its US opponents, but sheer horsepower allowed the Americans to loft superior firepower, substantial armor, and overbuilt airframes. What the Japanese needed and never got was not a better Zero, but an all-new fighter, a Japanese Hellcat. When the war ended and the Zero stood down, the US was within a week of introducing yet a third generation of Pacific fighters in the form of the Bearcat. The Zero began the Pacific War with an aura of invincibility. At the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor, 521 Zeros were active in the Pacific, 
328 in first-line units. The carrier-borne Model 21 was the type encountered by the Americans. Its tremendous range over 2,600 kilometers allowed it to range farther from its carrier than expected, appearing over distant battlefronts and giving Allied commanders the impression that there were several times as many Zeros as actually existed. After Pearl Harbor, it quickly became to be viewed as some kind of mystery ship, imbued with strange powers, able to do things that no other airplane could. Yet it was simply a well-engineered, straightforward, optimized aircraft for maneuverability, and flown against an enemy that had never credited the Japanese with the ability to design a cutting-edge fighter. Even though the Claire Chenault of Flying Tigers had been sent back to the US, reports of the airplane's capability over China they were ignored, and American aircraft recognition manuals didn't even include a picture of the Zero. As aviation historian William Green wrote, The Zero created a myth. The myth of a Japanese invincibility in the air. Its successive appearance over every major battle area in the opening days of the war seemed to indicate that the Japanese possessed unlimited supplies of this remarkable fighter. And its almost mystical powers of maneuver and ability to traverse vast stretches of water fostered the acceptance of a myth of its invincibility in Allied minds. Zeros often showed up so far from the nearest Japanese-controlled land that the Americans set out in search of the carrier from which it was assumed they'd taken off. The Zero was designed by a team under the direction of the brilliant young aeronautical engineer Jiro Horikoshi. Mitsubishi had the foresight to send Horikoshi to work and observe at aircraft factories in Europe and in the US in 1929, and he even spent several months at Curtis Plant in New York as an acceptance inspector for a batch of P-6 Hawk Pursuit biplanes the Japanese had ordered. Horikoshi had already engineered the Mitsubishi A-5M, later codenamed the Claude by the Allies. For an open cockpit, fixed-gear fighter, the A-5M displayed outstanding performance, in no small part because of its flush riveting a production technique that the Japanese would subsequently use on the Zero at a time when American airframers were just discovering its low drag advantage. In order to fight not only the already overmatched Chinese, but also the Pacific War against the US that was beginning to look inevitable, however, Japan still needed something more than just the Claude. The Japanese would never have attacked Pearl Harbor if they didn't have the Zero. At the time, in fact, some planners had misgivings that there weren't yet enough Zeros available for the attack to succeed. When the Japanese Navy gave Mitsubishi its marching orders as the Zero design began, it demanded a triple threat, an escort with the extreme range that needed to accompany bombers deep into China and later to cover over vast Pacific distances, a point defense interceptor with a rapid rate of climb to hit attacking bombers before they reached their targets, and a consummate dogfighter with extreme maneuverability. Though it's often assumed that the Japanese Army Air Force also flew Zeros, it never did. Another Zero oddity is that though all Japanese naval aviators were carrier qualified, many, including the famous Zero Super Ace Saburo Sakai, never operated from a carrier in combat. The extreme range criterion resulted in one piece of a little acknowledged pioneering for which the Zero was responsible. It was the first airplane designed from inception to carry an ejectable external fuel tank. A Zero's maximum fuel load, including the belly tank, typically was about 230 gallons. And this gave it seven or eight hours of combat endurance. Sakai set the zero endurance record, just over 12 hours by throttling back to 1,700 RPM and running what today we'd call lean of peak, maximum height exhaust gas temperature at just 130 miles an hour. He intentionally ran his tanks bone dry while circling above Formosa Air Base after a mission and dead sticked in from 8,000 feet. Another zero innovation was its 360 degree view cockpit canopy, second only to the British Westland Whirlwind's bubble canopy. Though it was a multi-pane greenhouse rather than a true bubble, the Zero's glassware provided a considerably better rearward view than anything but a true open cockpit design, and had also excellent drag-reducing properties. It could also be opened in flight but not jettisoned, making parachute egress difficult. It was assumed that a Zero Samurai would continue fighting to their death rather than bail out. Most Zero pilots refueled to wear parachutes in any case, until they ultimately were ordered to strap them on. In the late 1930s, the Japanese had developed nothing more powerful than several 800 to 1000 HP radials with little grown potential. At a time when American, British, and German manufacturers were cranking out 1,200 horsepower engines with 2,000 horsepower visible on the horizon. So Horikoshi needed to make his new fighter super light, which he did in part by having lightened holes cut and drilled through every internal airframe part possible, a technique that race car builders would recognize immediately. 
Horikoshi also persuaded the Navy to change its ultimate load standards for many components he didn't consider crucial. He designed them to fail, but then rebound them to previous shape as soon as they were reduced. As a result, the Zero was the fastest 1000 HP radial engine fighter ever produced, but one with a number of single point failure locations that, if hit, could bring down the airplane. The Zero was skinned with the lightest gauge aluminum possible, and when the shadows were right, some photos of the Zeros in flight show them seemingly clothed in crinkled tinfoil. British test pilot Eric Brown, who flew a captured Zero immediately after the war, even today recalls the constant noise of the oil canning fuselage skin, like the sound produced when one pushes on the side of a large biscuit tin. A typical Zero, loaded with full fuel and ordnance, weighed about 5,500 pounds, less than a mid-sized Cessna twin. A fully loaded Hellcat weighed over twice as much. The single heaviest component of any airframe is the main wing spar. Horikoshi lightened the Zeros by 30% by using a new zinc aluminum alloy called Super Ultra Dura Aluminum, which had recently been developed by Sumitomo Metals. One major benefit of the 7075 over the Sumitomo metal was that it was very corrosion resistant. In another weight-saving measure, the Zero's main spar was continuous, from wingtip to wingtip, and thus was an inseparable part of the fuselage center section rather than having a left and right wing, each bolted to the fuselage. This eliminated the weight of fasteners and spar buckets. Though it might seem that permanently affixed wings could make a Zero difficult to transport, Horikoshi had designed the entire tail cone and empennage to easily unbolt just aft of the cockpit. With everything removed forward of the firewall as well, the wing and cockpit became a single long but light narrow truckload. Horikoshi's search for lightness led him to the oft-criticized failure to include adequate armor or self-sealing fuel tanks in the Zero design. What was forgotten, however, is that virtually no fighters at the time the Zero was introduced had such features. It remained for the Battle of Britain in the summer of 1940 to demonstrate the need for armor in protected tanks. In any case, the Zero's designers considered armor unnecessary because they didn't think anybody would be able to put any rounds into the fighter. Maybe a lucky shot here and there, but not enough of a danger to compromise the design's lightness. Little did they know what the Navy and Marines had in store for them. Most combat units also removed their Zero's radios for additional weight savings, since the Japanese transceiver was very poor quality. This left the Zero pilots unable to warn wingmen of surprise attacks, and they could coordinate their own attacks only with occasional hand signals. A typical multi-plane Zero attack was a melee of individual aerobatics, and Japanese pilots were in nearly as much danger of mid-airs with their mates as they were of getting shot at. As one of the USN pilots put it, from the way Zero pilots rollicked around in the sky, at times, it looked as they would rather stunt than fly. Yokonawa flew upside down, having both hands around the cockpit wrote Sakai in his book Samurai. Then, he flew directly over me, under me, and went through a wide hesitation roll around my fighter. He was like a kid showing off. He finally flew on my wing and held the stick between his knees. Still grinning, he waved his lunchbox at me and started to eat. The Zero's flight controls mix some ingenious engineering with at least one awkward feature. Its ailerons were large and powerful, which added greatly to the fighter's low speed maneuverability and spectacular roll weight but they were very difficult to deflect at high speeds. American pilots soon learned to dive and turn sharply, especially to the right, which substantial prop-induced torque made particularly difficult for the Zero when they had a Zero on their tail. Horikoshi did an interesting job with the Zero's elevator, however. The airplane's speed range was broad, from low-speed maneuvering to flat-out dashes at more than 300 miles an hour, and elevator effectiveness, of course, increased with speed, to the point where it could become quite touchy, so Horikoshi designed an elastic control system, with thin elevator cables that stretched a bit as speed increased in slightly flexible elevator control torque tube. Normally, such a setup would be an anathema to an aeronautical engineer, for it encouraged an elevator to flutter as speeds increased, but somehow, whether through luck or engineering talent, Horikoshi found a sweet spot where there was no danger of flutter, yet elevator control forces remained constant regardless of the airspeed. Zeros were feared in part because of the two heavy wing mounted 20mm cannons, Swiss Orlikans built under license by the Japanese. Horikoshi suspected that the Zero would yaw appreciably as first one and then the other cannon fired and recoiled, so he specified for a fuselage longer than its optimal length, which gave the vertical stabilizer a longer moment arm and thus provided greater longitudinal stability. But the Orlikans were still problematic. 
They had a low rate of fire, limited capacity, initially only 60 rounds per gun, later increased to 100, and low muzzle velocity. The latter meant that the cannon was effective for close-in fighting, where a single round into a wildcat's wing, root, or cockpit could mean a kill. But as the distance to a target increased, the cannon's rounds would lose energy and drop away ineffectually, like a softball thrown underhand. A number of the Zero's smaller components, such as instruments and engine accessories, were also license-built Bendix, Sperry, Colesman, and other designs, which could lead to later claims that the airplane was a copy of the Hughes H-1 racer or the vaguely similar-looking Vought V-143. But as Horikoshi later wrote, we were trying to surpass the rest of the world's technology, not just catch up to it. The Zero's single most important US part was its Hamilton standard design constant speed propeller. The Japanese had also bought a V-143 in 1937, and the Zero's landing gear and retraction mechanism was almost certainly a copy of the Vought's design. After all, the Zero was one of the first retractables the Japanese built. The Zero's two cowl-mounted machine guns were not particularly effective, especially against the new generation of heavies overbuilt the US fighters. At little more than a half of the caliber of the American 50 cals, they were used by many Zero pilots mainly as pointers for their cannons. If they saw hits from the machine guns, they toggled the cannons alive and fired them instead. Just like a World War I Spot or Fokker, the Zero's receivers were in the cockpit, above the instrument panel on either side, and the pilot pulled levers to charge them. Ultimately, the Zero's main failing was that it was designed to a 1930s paradigm. Air combat meant dogfighting, and dogfighting, at least in the days before energy management, meant to circle chase in one form or another, with the better airplane turning tighter than the lesser one and eventually getting into a firing position from a rear quarter. Victory was then nearly inevitable. And the Zero was the world's tightest turning, most maneuverable fighter. Thanks to its aerobatic ability, Zero pilots also developed a combat maneuver that initially baffled American airmen, a kind of sideways loop with square turns and side slips out of the turns, which tightened their turn greatly. It didn't take long, however, for American pilots to learn that the rat racing with the Zero was a loser's game, so they disbanded tail chases that played straight into the Zero's only air combat strength. It was neither strong, unusually fast, good in a dive, nor effectively armed. Hit and run became the mantra, attack a Zero from above, fire while diving upon it, and keep going. Convert diving energy into zooming altitude and do it again if necessary. Perhaps it was inevitable that the Zero would become a myth, a legend, a paragon amongst fighters, when it was in fact a conventional plane with several ahead of its time characteristics. It could be argued that the Zero was an excellent airplane, but a lousy fighter. If you discount the victories over poorly trained Chinese pilots flying outmodded Soviet fighters, the huge fleet of Allied aircraft destroyed while they were parked in the opening days of the war, and the kills of utterly unprepared American pilots in many cases flying adequate airplanes but using the wrong tactics against the Zero, the mythical Mitsubishi comes off surprisingly poorly. It was extremely light and had numerous failure points where very few rounds of heavy caliber machine gun fire could do catastrophic damage. It was flammable, and its pilots were terribly vulnerable. It was not particularly fast, and in any case, its high-speed handling was poor. Its controls were poorly harmonized. Its armament was a mixed bag of two light machine guns and crude cannons. It had no useful communications equipment. Ultimately, the Zero was a bare-bones airplane. Nothing extra, nothing fancy. With very little margin for modification, designs which had little, if any, stretch built into them, wrote Zero expert Robert Mikesh. Some say that because the Zero was the best dogfighter in the Pacific theater, perhaps the world, it was by definition the best fighter. But there's also an old saying, to win, you have to finish. Unfortunately for the Japanese, the Pacific War was one race that the Zero finished last. Dead last. Okay, 
一番の特徴はですね、はいえー、私に言わせますならば行動力ですねあ長い、えー、非常に長時間飛べるっていうことです、はいえー、どんな素晴らしい格闘性能を持っていても時間がなくてはですねいい知らん浮かばないです、はいはい、だから私はもう行動力だと思うんです第2番目が堀越先生、えー、苦心の作であるところのこのエレベーター昇降だですね、はい、この機種を上げ下げするこの火事の効き具合が操縦桿の引き具合とこのエレベーターの効き具合が低速でも高速でも操縦,操縦するパイロットの考えてる通り動いてくれるように設計されてるこれがこの格闘性の特に縦の運動ですね、はい、この宙返りを利用した縦の運動これが非常に優れてたということです。ですからあもちろん真後ろついた場合はですねどんなに彼らが逃げ回っても絶対我々がこの真後ろへピャッとつけたらですね、はい、大体3 5 6メー,ターか4 0メー,ターどんな逃げ方してもプロレスで言えばキーロックですね,なるほどねガツッとはめたらもう仕留めますもう逃げられないボタンコじゃなければただこういう具合にめったになりませんけどなった時でもこの縦の運動に引っ込めば、はい、大体3000点から4000点すれば挽回するとそのくらいに、えー、ゼロ戦の特徴というものはこの縦の運動のエレベーターを利用したところの私なんかはあの斜め宙返りを利用したひねり込みと言ってましたけど、はい、このひねり込みがあ古いパイロットには一人一人味のあるですねる自分用の、えー、技をですね、はい、いつの間にか開発していきましたその当時ですね、はい、本当に私たちがあのラボル国体で油の乗り切ってる頃、はい、ちょうどこのスピンナーの先この先端ですね、はい、これはこういう感じでてましたよあの一体ですねそれからこの先翼端がですねこの中指に感じてましたねそのくらいに完全に飛行機マッサしてましたからもう地上で自分の体を動かすよりも空中で、えー、ゼロ戦掃除してバーッと向ける方が早くて確実に行くぐらいに完全に飛行機そのものが自分になってました戦闘機というのはですねその周り360度全部敵ですから、はい、むしろこう敵を探すとか見張る場合には私なんかもう前を2後ろを9と前を2後ろを9になる、はい、横の裏と胴体のこのここが一番怖いんです見えないところですからどっから来るか分かりませんが年中こう腰をひねってですね飛行機をひっくり返しながら、えー、自分の後ろが大丈夫かってことを見て前はパッと見れば分かりますから、はい、もうすぐ気になりますから。これを気にならない人はやられるんです私たち考えてましたのは非常に<咳>、えー、重量を軽く作ってありますから、はい非常に機体全般が弱かったですねそうですかアメリカの飛行機には絶対そんなことないんですけども,もうこのゼロ戦には制限スピードというのがありましてそれを出すとバイッていくのが危ないんですね、はい、いつもきあの危険を感じてましたそれからあ第2番目が、えー、弾を食らった場合に、えー、全く覚えようがないということです最後のこれは、まあ、パイロットあたりちょっとカバーしたり、えータンクをちょっとやったりしましたけども、はいまあ、全般的に見てほとんど無防御という形ですから、うん、あやられたらもうライターのように火がつくと、うん、そういう弱点があったんですね、えー、こちらから攻めていく場合何百まで飛んでいく場合にはもうどういうものか日本軍はその生きて旅衆の恥ずかしみを受けるというその絶対に捕虜にならないという考えでしたからそれ強制されたもんじゃなかったんですけども攻めていく場合には落下さん持ってきませんでしたね落下さんはもちろん座布団、ね、クッション代わりに持ってきますけどもバンドをもう置いていっちゃうんですだから落下さん持っていかないと同じで敵地上でやられたらもう自爆する以外ないと。今考えればもったいないことでそれで随分死んでるんですけどもね右の目はほとんど見えなくなってますし左の目もやられてもうほとんど失明状態で
コンパスが全然見えないんですよねちょうどここへ、えー、一発はこういう球が当たってますねそしてこれ抜けたんですねこれ抜けてるわけですか、はい、でその時の傷がこの傷ですけどもねそれから一発はこっちから入って、はい、でこれをかすったんですねああなるほどはい、はい、だからほとんど失神状態で頭やられたってことも後で分かったんですけどもね、はい、それからその時血を止めたのが最後のマフラーこれ残りましてこれで、えー、血を止めたんですよこの地図のようにですね、はい、航路がめちゃくちゃでしょ、えー、島も何にもないとこ行ってしまってこのまま行ったらハワイ行ってしまうと思ったんですラブオールはこの辺にあるような感じがするんですよ、はい、自分の飛行の癖と飛行機の癖を見ましてね、はいはい、それで見えた瞬間に起点が取れませんから、はい、地球上のどこにいるかわからないですから、えー、コンパス見えても、はい、それどうもこの辺にあると思ったけどもねここまで来て30度や40度をケチケチするなと思ってですね男らしく直角に曲がれと思って直角に直角に曲がったわけですよそれがドンピシャリ当たったわけですこういうような、えー、15ラウンドを戦ったボクサーの姿みたいですよね顔の格好もいかんでしまって Let's take the case of one pilot. His name was Jimmy Saunders. His story starts on the day when he was flying to a base somewhere in the Far East. Come in. And it's Saunders reporting for duty, sir. Glad to have you with us, Lieutenant. Glad to be here, Major. We can certainly use you. Sit down. Cigarette? Oh, thank you, sir. How was the flight over? Well, I made it, sir, with the help of a P-40. You like our P-40? Oh, yes, sir. It's a nice airplane. Good. Then maybe we can count on you not to shoot any of them down. Well, I didn't have any plans along that line, sir. It's been done, you know. You mean jet pilots? I mean American pilots. Men with as much enthusiasm for the P-40 as you have, but with an unfortunate lack of ability to tell a friend from an enemy. Excuse me, sir, but how could anybody mistake a P-40 for a Zero? A great many things can happen in the excitement of preparing for combat. Too many pilots are too anxious to make sure of the kill. They start shooting before they've made certain what they're shooting at. It's a damn sight better to let a Zero get away than to knock down one of your own planes. Say nothing of one of your own men. We feel enough to spare around here. Sir, I had no idea. We're not broadcasting the fact. I know, but... I don't misunderstand me, Lieutenant. It's not a common occurrence. Most of our men know their plane. Uh, identification becomes second nature to them. If there's still a doubt in their minds, they maneuver close enough to make sure. Well, of course, there is such a thing as being too cautious. Take the case of the man who drew those silhouettes. Say, that's quite a job. He had plenty of time for it. Been flat on his back for two months. Shot down while he was still maneuvering around trying to decide if the other plane was a zero or not. He found out. If he'd known his identification, that zero might never have gotten him. Well, he learned his lesson, and to make certain that others would profit by it, he put it all down in those. All right, let's see if you can do your wafting on the zero. Yes, sir. With or without looking. You might as well make it easy on yourself now. It'll be a lot tougher upstairs. Yes, sir. Wings, leading edge tapers, trailing edge tapers, tips rounded, slight dihedral angle. You might add to that that there are two 20-millimeter cannons mounted one in each wing, probably Swiss Ehrlichen guns. Yes, sir. Here's something I didn't know about, sir. Huh? Oh, yes. The wingtips can be folded so as to utilize more space in a carrier. Incidentally, the span is 39 feet 4 inches. All right, go on with the engine. Engine, radio, Mitsubishi version of our cyclone. That's right. There are twin-row 14 cylinders. Now for the fuselage. Fuselage. Blunt nose the spinner on it. Cockpit canopy sits on the fuselage. Retractable landing gear with fairing plates. Say, uh, there seems to be one gear missing, sir. The gears are operated hydraulically. As a result, the wheels retract alternately. 
I guess there are a couple of things I don't know about this airplane, sir. I'm glad to hear you admit it. That's the beginning of wisdom. The wings and the fuselage are in one piece, made of dual aluminum. Uh, there's another feature worth noting. The entire fuselage is flush riveted. With the result, there are very few protuberances to cause wind resistance. The length is 28 feet, 5 inches. There's a pair of machine guns mounted in grooves above the cowling. They're 7.7 millimeter, and they're synchronized to fire through the propeller. I hope you don't ever get them on your tail. I'm with you there, sir. <laughs> All right, finish her up. Tail. Leading edge of flat surface tapers more than trailing edge, with the fuselage extending to a point beyond it. Leading edge of vertical piece tapers more than trailing edge. Tail is pointed, curves out away from the nose. I guess that's it, sir. Good enough. As you probably know, there are three types of zeros. One is a single float plane without rig. All three have slightly varying characteristics. But this is the type you're most apt to tangle with, so get to know her. All of her. Yes, sir. I'll look for the balls of rouge on her wings and fuselage. Yeah, I wouldn't depend on that if I were you. The Japs have a neat trick of painting her all sorts of colors. Sometimes even like our P-40s. Coffee? Uh, no, thanks. Well, sir, how soon do I get a chance to knock one up and down? Soon enough. But don't get any idea that the Zero is a pushover. With 340 miles an hour top speed, a service ceiling of 35,500 feet, and a normal range of 700 miles, increased by a droppable extra fuel tank, there's not much she can't do. They built her light and maneuverable, threw away the armor protection for the pilot and the self-sealing gasoline tanks. The only way is around 5,200 pounds fully loaded and has a horsepower of over 900. And when you see the speed with which she climbs, you'll appreciate what I'm saying. There's just no use trying to dogfight a zero. That's out. Your best bet is to hit fast, either the wings or just behind the cockpit. But if you miss, don't hang around. Really as bad as all that, sir? Seeing's believing. If I were you, I'd take my word for it. Yes, sir. Now, here is our operation. When you're on your own, you'll do patrol from our base here to these outlying islands. finally came. Saunders was on his own, out chap hunting. Looks sort of keyed up. Wouldn't you be? Don't expect too much, Lieutenant. Not on your first day. What's up? See something? It's a plane, all right. But what sort of a plane? Friend or enemy? P-40 or zero? Well, now's the time to remember your recognition. Now, has it a deep radiator, round tail curving in toward nose, inline engine? Then it's a P-40. Or has that plane an oil cooler, an air scoop, pointed tail curving out away from nose, radial engine? If it has, then it's a zero. Tough to tell from here. Maybe if you got closer. Start climbing, Saunders. stopping you. Go on over there.
Are you sure, P-40? I'm positive, sir. After he held fire, he drew up and dipped his wings in recognition. I don't like to complain, sir, but do we have to fight our own Air Force too? You've got good cause to complain. I don't know who's responsible for this, but what I do... Come in. Major, I want to... I'm sorry, sir. Lieutenant Saun is reporting, sir. Yes, Lieutenant? Well, in here has been telling me that he was attacked this afternoon by one of our planes. Do you, by any chance, know anything about this? Yes, sir. I'm afraid it was me. He's afraid. Well, Saunders, what have you got to say for yourself? Not much, sir. For distance, I was sure it was a zero. Then I held my fire. A little because... late on your identification, weren't you? Yes, sir. But I did run. How far were you from the other plane when you opened fire? I'm not quite sure, sir. We'll soon find out. Have your film developed immediately. Yes, sir. Major, I want... You can wait, Lieutenant. Get after that film. Yes, sir. Corporal, get the projector ready. Yes, sir. How could you start firing at that distance? Hold it. Didn't you look in your sight? I thought I did, sir. You don't seem to be very sure of yourself, Lieutenant. I'm sure of one thing, Major. After I... Look at that airplane. It's closer now, I realize. But even at the distance you started firing, you should have been able to identify it. Look at that deep radiator, the inline engine. That cockpit canopy fits into the fuselage. The tail is round and curves in toward the nose. All right, Corporal, take it away. Uh, there's more film, sir. I'm sorry, Lieutenant, but I have an appointment. You can stay and run it if you want to. Coming, Weldon. Uh, if you don't mind, sir, I think I'll stay for a few more feet. I want to see how close I came to being wiped out. Carry on, Corporal. Now I know what a clay pigeon feels like. Hey, wait a minute. That's not me. It's a zero. What? Huh? Hold it. Well, Saunders, I think I'll forego that appointment. Let's hear about this. Well, sir, following my encounter with the lieutenant here, I was flying along. I'm wondering if I should slit my throat. I felt like a candidate for the Jap Air Force. It's getting time to turn for home. Not that I was homesick. I had a hunch what was in store for me. Well, there was no use stalling. I was thinking, that other guy's probably back already, telling the Major how he almost got knocked down by another P-40. I was thinking what you'd tell me when I got back. Suddenly, I stopped thinking. I saw something. Another plane. I tried to make her out. She was too far away. I started to climb. I had to get my recognition right this time. Cigar-shaped fuselage tapering to point and rear. Check. Wings close to nose. Canopy sits on fuselage. Check. Tail pointed. Curving out. Blunt nose. Snubby spinner. Radial engine. Oil cooler. Air scoop at bottom of nose. It's a zero. Check. Explosion and 
I guess that's all, sir. Well, that's enough. Oh, it's slow. What's the matter with you, Weldon? Well, it just occurred to me, sir. There, but by the grace of God, went I. <laughs> I see your point. I don't think, however, that you'll have anything to worry about in the future. At least not from Saunders. He seems to have learned his lesson. By a method I'd hardly recommend putting into general practice, but nevertheless, he's learned it thoroughly. If every pilot would only realize the importance of identification and become letter perfect in the art of identification, the fewer lives lost and fewer planes destroyed. You know your enemy, but also know your friends. 